Uh, so anyway, Zephaniah chapter number 2, without further delay, we'll get into the message tonight. Uh, uh, beginning in verse number 4. So Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, for Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. Woe unto the inhabitants of the sea coast, ye nation of the Cherethites! The word of the Lord is against you. O Canaan, the land of the Philistines, I will even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. Vai locuitorile țărmului mării, națiunea cheratiților, cuvântul Domnului este împotriva voastră, canane, țara filistenilor, te, uh, te voi nimici până nu va mai fi nici locuitor. I'm calling our message tonight Rescuing the Remnant. Mesajul nostru în această seară este chemat de a scăpa pe rămășiță. That remnant of believers that will still be left at the end of everything. Acea rămășiță care va rămânea la sfârșit de tot. But I'm not speaking about just anybody. Dar nu vorbesc despre oricine. I'm speaking about that remnant of Israel. That typically Zephaniah seems to refer to them as Judah. Uh, and I think there's a lot of prophetical context to why. Uh, but when you look at this passage, it's easy to want to think that there's a lot of really deep uh, things going on here. Este ușor să te gândești că se întâmplă o mare lucru. You always want to think, oh, I've got to look at every time Ashdod is ever mentioned in the Bible. Este aproape că vrei să spui că trebuie să te uiți la fiecare dată când Ashdod este menționat în Biblie. And find out the spiritual significance of that city. Și să afli semnificanța spirituală a celui oraș. And the truth is, God mentions nothing by mistake. Și adevărul este că Dumnezeu nu pune nimic prin greșeală, nu menționează. So you probably could get some deeper insight than I am going to give you tonight. Și probabil tu poți să aduci lucruri mai adâncite despre cele care ți le vă da ție în această seară. By studying these individual cities. Prin a studia fiecare cetate individuală. But I believe the main thought he's trying to convey here is really simple. If you were to look at a map of Israel, uh, you know, it has a, a fairly unique shape to it. Uh, it's like a big triangle. Uh, and the bottom corner over here uh, is where Judah occupies. There at the sea coast. Uh, the cities he is mentioning are all part of that land where the Philistines typically occupy. That place that almost any time you're opening to the story of kings and by that I mean David and all the kings or even going back into the book of Judges uh, you you see that this is for their whole history this area they've been fighting for. Pentru toată istoria pentru această locație se lupta. Even today this is the area that they still fight about. Chiar și astăzi aceasta este acel loc care încă se luptă pentru. I mean and when you hear about Israel today. Când auzi despre Israel astăzi. And the big argument over what land is theirs and what is not. Și această ceartă mare despre care pământ este al lor și care nu. It's always about God. Este întotdeauna despre acel loc al Which is part of this. care este parte de acea Uh, the land of the Cherethites mentioned in the second verse of Rand was actually part of Judah. I mean, they lived in the land where Judah was. It was the southern part of their territory. And so, really, if you want to make this very simple, God is telling them that to this remnant of believers, uh, which in Zephaniah is being referred to as Judah, that 
when Christ comes back, he's going to give their land back to them. So again, you might can find a lot of deep insight as to why each city is special. Like if you go read about Ashkelon, uh, you know, a lot of people think it was the largest seaport there. You know, it'd be like the Rotterdam of Israel. Uh, but in a good way, not a normal way. But what you have is that for the most part he's naming the major cities in the land where the Philistines occupy. And then he's naming a particular part of Judah's territory. That was occupied by the Cherethites. And was also a place where they had to take back from time. First Samuel 30 and verse 14 gives some insight. It says, we made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah and upon the south of Caleb and we burned Ziklag with fire. So that coast he's referring to <coughs> that's where all those cities we just read are listed are at. You know, all the cities we read in verse 4 are there at the coast. Uh, and so what this verse is teaching you <laughs> is that that area should belong to Judah. It's rightfully theirs. And so what that also should be saying uh, is that in this day Christ is going to restore to that faithful portion of Israel what is rightfully theirs. Uh, that he's going to give them the land that should belong to them. So while today we see a lot of fighting and arguing about what should be theirs and what shouldn't, I am going to put it this way. Prophecy shows us it's always going to be like that. It always has been. It always will be. However, what we're going to see in a moment is that there's more going on here than just simple land disagreement. <laughs> that the reason why Israel is not occupy or this portion of Israel is not occupying their land is because of persecution that has taken place before Christ coming back. But before we get into that, let's read a few more verses. It says in verse 6, And the sea coast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds, and folds for flocks. See, we just finished verse, uh, the verse before this, verse uh, 5, saying that there will be no inhabitants of Canaan. And so here he gives you a, an understanding of what he means. It's not so much that the land itself is going to be hurt. The land is still going to be a good place. In fact, in a minute he's going to tell them that they're going to be able to just go in and inhabit houses. Uh, it's the people that he's going to destroy. Zechariah 14.21 says that as well. It says, Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, 
And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seed therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. The thing I see as interesting in that uh, is that in so much of what we've been reading, when Christ comes back, there's going to be utter destruction. You know, you're seeing places where lands are going to be destroyed. I mean, that's what we've been reading about so much until now. But here we're seeing him taking back the land. And it's the people who are there wrongfully. Și este acești oameni, sunt acești oameni care sunt acolo în mod nedrept. That are going to be destroyed. Care vor fi distruși. Now, it's a verse that comes up in a minute. Este un verset care va veni în ceva timp. Is why I say that they're going to be destroyed. De ce am spus că vor fi distruși. Uh, because he compares them to being destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. Din cauza că îi compare că ei vor fi distruși ca să doma și Gomorra. Uh, and so what I see in this is that Christ will come back and in setting up his kingdom that remnant of Israel you know, those ones who will turn to him during the seven years uh, that they will be rewarded at least partly uh, by Christ giving them the land that should be theirs in the first place. Now, that's a simple prophecy. Uh, it shows you a little bit more where Israel fits in all this. Because so many people make a mistake. That they either try to write Israel out of prophecy altogether. Or they try to make it all about Israel. Because until now, we We've read about how he's inviting everybody else uh, to come and seek him in righteousness and meekness. Uh, and we've read about how that those who refuse to seek him because of pride and rebellion uh, he is going to deal with them. Uh, and so that shows you that this is about more than just Israel. So for those who try to write the rest of the world out and say it's all about them, then you miss the first verses. You've missed how he's dealt with all these other nations by name. You miss all the prophecies where he talks about reaching out to the Gentiles. So while there's going to be a huge emphasis put on Israel during this time, when you read Revelation, you see that. You can't limit it to one group or the other. So those who teach replacement theology and write Israel out of it, they're absolutely ridiculous. They obviously have not read their Bible. Or they just don't believe it. Uh, because you cannot interpret the Bible properly. And write them out of it. I will show you several passages tonight that prove that point beyond just what we see here. <laughs> Uh, but I just give you that because it shows you that God during this time is going to be bringing Israel back into doing what they should have done. One of the important points of prophecy in this time 
is the Israel who always was supposed to be a light for God and failed terribly. <coughs> During that seven years we'll get a chance to finally shine for Him. Uh, but because of that uh, you're going to see other people believing uh, which I don't have time to show you that tonight uh, but hopefully maybe next week or in the near future we can look at what turns Israel back to God and then we can possibly also look at how God uses them to affect others Uh, the problem is that it requires taking a, a parenthetical sidestep over away from Zephaniah. Uh, so anyways, we see here that God's going to give them what is theirs. That he's going to remove the, the Canaanites, those who try to take it. You know, everyone who's dwelling in that land that has no right to be there. Because God gave it to Israel, not them. And God always told Israel to drive all of those people out. So everyone who's trying to live in the land of Canaan that has no right to be there. Uh, and then we'll read verse 7. Uh, or I believe we read this. It says, And the coast shall be uh, for the remnant, the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon in the house of Eshkelon. They shall lie down in the evening. For the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. I want you to know there's two things going on in that verse. One is that he's going to give it to them in complete peace. Uh, it's almost like Well, it's an incredible thing when you think about it. That so much of the promises he made them when he brought them out of Egypt. Like that he would drive out the enemy from before them and they could go in and possess them. You're seeing a lot of this come back in the last time. So you see that not Not only is he going to give them what is rightfully theirs, but unlike when you read Joshua, he's going to take it back and give it to them. <clears throat> Now, if you know the Old Testament, that was always God's intention. I mean, originally he told them, I'll send in bees before you and drive them out. Uh, but their lack of faith caused one generation not to enter in in the first place. And the next to have to fight for it. And so you see an interesting parallel in this. That their faith during persecution, the, the fact that they're going to trust God when so much of the world is following the Antichrist, When Christ comes back, he's going to give them the land in peace. So if there's a lesson you can learn from them, it's that if you trust God, uh, then he surely has a better method a, a better plan uh, than whatever you could come up with. Now, I don't want to say that means you're always going to get what you want peacefully. I mean, for example, this portion 
exemplu, această porție, uh, these are the last days. Acestea din ultimele zile. They're going to have to go through persecution like there never was from the beginning of time. Ei vor trebui să treacă prin persecuție ca și cum nu au trecut niciodată de la începutul lumii. But when Christ gives it. Dacă Hristos se dăruiește. There's a verse in the Bible. Um, it says the blessing of the Lord is good. It adds no sorrow therewith. See, when they get it his way, it doesn't mean that it always is going to come easy in the beginning. But that what he gives is best and what he gives is right. That it doesn't then become a burden to you. Nu va deveni o povară pentru tine după. Uh, and so what we see through this is that lesson. But the other side of this is that we see that they are coming from what he calls bondage. Este că vedem că vine așa cum cheamă din From captivity. Din captivitate. Uh, that you see they're coming from a place of persecution. Vine dintr-un loc al persecutării. And so we read in verse 8. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the revilings of the children of Ammon whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. Din versetul 8 am auzit o cară m-a abărâșit prețuit de copiilor lui Amon cu care au oferit poporul lor și s-a preamărit peste granițele lor. So he says those that are their neighbors uh, have come against them to try to take their land. That they have reviled them uh, and they have magnified themselves against them. Well, it's to raise up against them to attack. Now, if you go back to what we've already studied, you already know part of what that means. Part of that is that battle of Armageddon. When the armies are gathered into the, the valley of the mountain. Uh, you know, when they're gathered there together for that battle when Christ crushes them. But here's where I'm going to give you a prophecy lesson. I want to explain how they get to this place where Christ then must come and deliver them. Matthew 24 and verse 15. Uh, verse We're going to read several verses from a few different chapters. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. De aceea când veți vedea orice amusire spusă prin Daniel Propetul, stăm în picioare, nu vă spun ce ne citește să înțeleagă. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, let him which is on the housetop uh, not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is of the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, uh, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not uh, since the beginning of the world to this time, no, never, nor ever shall be. Uh, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be short. Now, I'm going to explain that passage to you. The Bible gives you a clear outline of the tribulation. That you have seven years, three and a half, in the beginning, three and a half in the end. 
Now, Daniel makes it perfectly clear that the center point of that is the abomination of desolation. If you read this passage, Jesus also is going to teach you the same thing. Because all the things we know to take place in the first three and a half years, He's already talked about them up to this point. Everything we know should take place in the last three and a half years comes after verse 15. So the abomination of desolation, which maybe again when we do a study on the Antichrist attack on them. If we get to do that, we can look at what the verses actually teach on this. But the Bible defines this as being something likened to an event that has already happened. Now, some people when they read Daniel and he's describing the kings of the north, the kings of the south and he's going through all of this and giving you a detailed history of stuff that was future for him but is past for us. Some people read that uh, and they think that the man who is described as the king of the south there that went into the temple in Jerusalem uh, and sacrificed a pig that that was of course, the fulfillment of what he's talking about. And so, I understand there's a great deal of confusion that comes for people. But if you read it in the context of Daniel as a whole, I think it becomes clear what he's doing. Because he takes this man, who all the other people he's giving you no information about them personally. He's just told you what they did. But this guy he takes and breaks him down into a character. I mean, he tells you what his personality is like. And then immediately he begins to discuss the Antichrist. See, I believe what God is doing is he's taking a person who has already existed. Someone that we don't have time to study tonight. And he's taking an event that has already happened. And he's telling you that when the Antichrist does come, that he's going to be like this guy. That's why he gives you these characteristics. That's why he gives you this deep description of this man. And then immediately begins to make the comparison with the Antichrist. So, again, this is another place where some people fail to see that, yes, that prophecy has already taken place. Uh, that the kings of the north, kings of the south battles have already happened. And so they go into this and they don't realize that God is using this man as a picture of who the Antichrist is going to be. And so while they get one of the main points, they miss the other half. Then you have the other side of this. That so many people read this and see that this has perfectly been fulfilled. And then when they get to the bottom where he's mentioning things that are clearly about the Antichrist. Uh, they fail to see what God is doing. And that's that he's taking 
events that have happened. Real people who he knew would exist. And he's telling you that when the Antichrist comes, that what he does will be comparative to what this man did. Because in his heart, he's going to be like this man. So what I believe, and what's typically taught, is that the abomination of desolation will involve the Antichrist walking into the temple and declaring himself to be God. Uh, that he will tell the world he is the Christ and they should worship him. Now, if that includes a sacrifice, you can debate it. But the main thing I take away from this character study is that the halfway point of your tribulation period is when he walks into the temple and he says, I'm God. I'm the Messiah you've been waiting for. Now, the thing you begin to see, though, is that many people will bow down and believe him. That's where that one world religion you always hear talked about comes from. But we do see there are people who are not going to. Now, tonight we're talking about the Jewish side of that. I would like to maybe discuss the other side of that. Well, I say that's going to require some big side steps. But what you see is that Jesus says after the Antichrist does that that there is going to come a persecution on the remnant. He says on Judea. Uh, so he says this area here that there's coming a persecution on you. And you're going to have to run quickly. So quickly that you're not going to go back into your house to get started. Then when he comes, it's going to come like a flood to destroy you. And that you're going to have to run to the mountains to be hidden. Uh, and so he explains to them how this is going to be a time of trouble like there never was before. So pay attention to some of that terminology. And then let's go to Revelation chapter 12. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God. That they should feed her, uh, feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now I'll save you some math. It's three and a half years. There's something you have to do though. You have to count it according to what's called a prophetical year. Uh, which is not 365 days. Uh, it's 360 or something like that. Uh, and that's because that's what the calendar was then. You know, they didn't do the 365 one fourth days like we do. Uh, and so, if you do the math that way, it becomes three and a half years. That he's describing the woman. Well, if you know what's going on in Revelation 12, is representing Israel. Uh, you see, I call Revelation 12 uh, the history of the world written in the stars. Because it is a vision taking place in the stars. 
uh, where you have the devil represented as a dragon, uh, where you have Jesus being born uh, of the woman, uh, and the woman clearly representing Israel. And so you find that some of the events referenced seem to be further back, and some carry into the tribulation period. So in verse 6 where we read what he's describing is that for three and a half years, which we've already established take place after the midway point, that that believing portion of Israel, because who is a Jew indeed? Uh, those who are Jew in the heart, those who truly believe. Uh, they will have to flee into the wilderness. Now, he gives a further description beginning in verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time uh, from the face of the serpent. Și femeia a fost dată două aripi uh, ale unei actile mari ca să zboare în pustie la locul ei unde este grănită pentru un timp, timpul și jumătatea timpului ascunsă de fața șarpelui. So, time, time, half time, three and half years. Timp, timpul și timp, uh, uh, timp, timpul este jumate de, uh, o trei ani jumate. Uh, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. <coughs> and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's, this is the same exact thing Jesus just described. That after the halfway point, the believing remnant of Israel will have to flee to the mountains uh, and hide in the wilderness for three and a half years because the Antichrist is coming after them. Uh, and then finally, in the end of it all, he's going to gather his armies to the valley of Megiddo, and Christ is going to come back and destroy it. So let's read Jeremiah 30 uh, to see another perspective of this, uh, beginning in verse 6. Ask him at now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hand on his loins as a woman in travail? And all faces are turned into paleness. Întrebați acum și vedeți dacă un bărbat are durere de naștere, pentru că vă, pentru ce văd pe fiecare bărbat cu mâinile pe coasele sale, ca o femeie, ca o femeie în durere de naștere și toate fețele au devenit palide. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Vai, pentru că acea zi de tulburare... Vai, pentru că acea zi este mare, astfel încât niciuna nu este asemenea ei, aceasta este timp, chiar timpul de tulburare lui Iacob, dar el va fi salvat de acest timp. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off his neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more uh, serve themselves of him. Fiind că se va întâmpla în acea zi, spune Domnul știlor, că voi spărăma jocul lui de pe gâtul tău și îți voi rupe legăturile, But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their King, whom I will raise up unto them. Și ei vor să fie Domnul Dumnezeu lor și lui David împăratul lor pentru pe care îi voi ridica. Therefore, fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord. Neither be dismayed, O Israel. For lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. 
De aceea nu te teme, tu, servitorul meu Iacu, spune Domnul, nu te descuraja între ele, pentru că iată, te voi salva de departe pe tine și pe sămânța ta din țara captivităților și Iacob se va întoarce, se va odihni și se va liniști și va fi liniști și nimeni nu îl va spământa. So here Jacob's being used to refer to that believing portion of Israel. Aici este uh, Israel folosit ca, care se referă la acea uh, porție de rămâșită. Hey, you understand Jacob and Israel are the same person anyway. Iacob și Israel este aceeași persoană. And it's quite common in the Bible for Israel as a nation to be referred to by either name. So you find an even probably deeper description of Christ and his delivering them. Because what he's saying is the same thing. Ce spune este același lucru? That this time of Jacob's trouble. Acest timp a tulburării lui Iacob. What one writer refers to as the olive tree being shaken. Unde un scriitor se referă că este acel copac de măslin care este scuturat. Is going to be where in the last three and a half years. Va fi atunci în ultimii cei trei ani jumate. The Antichrist declares war on the believing portion of Israel. Antichrist va declara război în această fac a lui Israel. Now we know. That there's at least 144,000. Because for anyone who tells you that Israel is written off and God's done with them, uh, you're going to have a really hard time explaining how 144,000 male Jewish virgins uh, are going to come forward and be consecrated to God and seemingly be used to be that light to the world. Uh, because the very few verses that do talk about them are almost always connected uh, to other people coming to Christ. Uh, and so that's the only thing we can seem to learn about them in that regard. So what you have is that if I can give you my quick view of what will happen. In the last days, God teaches that he's going to give two witnesses who I would also love to take time to study them individually. Now, I believe that to be Moses and Elijah. Moses, we know, died. But God took his body and kept it personal. Elijah didn't die. Elijah was just taken home to hell. Now, even more so, you can give all the arguments you could ever want. But there's one that defeats any argument you could ever give as to who it is. When God wants to represent the Old Testament, what does he say? The law and the prophets. When God wants to name one person who represents the entire law, who does he name? Moses. When he wants to name one person who represents all the prophets, who does he name? Elijah. Now, beyond that, when Jesus met on the mountain with two people, who did he meet with? Moses and Elijah. Now, there's no question one of them is Elijah. If you want to argue that one, then just go look up what the Bible says about Elijah coming back. That John was going to be a forerunner and a picture to that. But at the second coming, Elijah is actually going to come back and preach. 
In terms of Moses, when you go read the Old Testament prophecies, they talk about and that prophet and that prophet uh, who will come back also with Elijah. Go read the description. It's pretty clear it's Moses. If that's not enough evidence, read what miracles they can do. It says they can stop the rain for three and a half years. One character in the Bible does that. It's Elijah. Uh, the other things that are described, uh, the plagues and so forth, those are always connected to Moses. So it's very clear that that's who these two witnesses are. The thing that's really interesting about them is this. God tells you that they will preach in Jerusalem for three and a half years. He tells it to you in days. So that you can't say, well, maybe he means it's close to three and a half years. Just like he tells you that Israel will be in hiding, the believing portion. In hiding, running away. Uh, for three and a half years exactly to the day. He says the same thing about these prophets. But here's where it gets interesting. They will be killed by the Antichrist. Their bodies will be left on the ground for three and a half days. And the Bible says everybody's going to see this. Then after three and a half days, they will be raised from the dead uh, and they will Will ascend to heaven. So you have something here. If he tells you in days they have to preach three and a half years. Well, it can't be in the last three and a half years. Uh, because what you wind up with is you still have to account for three and a half days after they finish preaching. After their so that means they have to preach in the first three and a half years. So here's what I believe. That at the same time in the same day, let me say it that way. When the church is taken out, because 1 Thessalonians 2 teaches that the same day that the Antichrist is revealed, the church has to be taken. Ah, and again, that's something we can get into another day. But you see that the same day that the church is taken, that you're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 4, and Revelation 5, as they begin to open those seals. The same day that first seal is going to be open. And the Antichrist is going to be unleashed. And so while he is building his kingdom for the first three and a half years, which cover at least your first four uh, seals, as the four horsemen are unleashed, him being the first of those, at the same time that's going on, God is going to send these two witnesses to his people. Uh, and so, for three and a half years as they're preaching, either during that time people are going to start to believe, or when they're risen, that's going to be the thing that really opens the eyes of a certain portion. I say this, 
Then because he gives you in days, how long Israel will have to run, that people will start to believe throughout their ministry. Uh, and that when he kills them, that at that same time, uh, that's when you see that he's also going to declare war on Israel. Uh, and that's when those believing believing Jews are going to have to run it. I believe through this is where through their ministries where the 144,000 come from. Uh, and I believe that they'll be sent out to preach to the world. But what you see in this is that when you start to connect the different passages, it does give you this clear picture. It gives you a clear timeline of what has to happen. Uh, and so that's why I've taught so many times that when you start trying to interpret prophecy, you have to take Old and New Testament and put them together. And you'll start to find that there's only one way to interpret it. That the different disagreements start to get broken away and taken away. Uh, and so what you have with Israel is what should be a beautiful message for us. That those people that God has done so much for them and yet for some reason they just never could seem to truly trust Him the way they should have. You know, it's always just that small portion that even in the end times it's still going to be that small portion. But even though God put them away for a time, He's going to bring them back. He's going to give them a chance. Those who love Him and serve Him, or I should say those who believe on Him, so that they're willing to, to flee the most powerful place in the world, that kingdom of the Antichrist. Because they refuse to worship a false messiah. That it may mean persecution for them like there has never been before or ever will be after. But in the end, when Christ comes, he says he'll give them the land in peace. And then let's go back to Zephaniah and read the last verse I want to give you from there. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom, and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah. Even, the, even the, the breeding of needles, and the salt pits, and the perpetual desolation, the residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. De aceea, precum eu trăiesc, spune Domnul știre, Dumnezeu Israel negreși, Moabul va fi casa Doma și copiii lui Amon, care domora, locul mulțirii, urzicilor și ochnelor și de sare și a pustirii, și o pustire veșnică. Restul poporului meu îi va plăda, îi va plăda și rămăsită poporului meu îi va stăpâni. So the lesson is this, that in those days, în aceste zile, that those who believe in him and therefore will have to suffer for him. That when Christ comes back, all those who rose up against him with the Antichrist, those who refuse to turn, and we've read all the judgments. So you can't really have pity on them when I say that they're going to be destroyed. If you have mercy on them, go read the trumpets and the vials. Where it says God does this. And in all of this, they still refuse to turn and they harden their hearts. 
And then finally in the end, they'll be destroyed. But those who trust in Christ will be rewarded. They will be given what is theirs. They'll be rightfully rewarded. But more than anything, that place that they fought for from the beginning. I mean, there's a beautiful picture when you think about that. This thing that God told them, you can have it. If you just listen to me, it's yours. And yet their own failure to trust and obey. Și uh, uh, lor în a se încrede și a, a asculta has caused them to never really be able to fully possess what God wanted them to have. I-a cauzat pe ei uh, să nu poată într-adevăr vreodată uh, pe mod de plin să ia ceea ce Dumnezeu a intenționat. That their faith in persecution credința lor și persecuția lor that faith that they have during the time of Jacob's trouble acea credință care vor avea în acest timp a încercării lui Iacob well, when Christ comes they'll finally be able to possess that. You may not feel like there's a lot in that message for you. But there is a lot in God's mercies being new every day. There's a lot of God's long suffering in that message. You want to talk about a history of failure, look at Israel. I mean, talk about the people who when the Messiah stood in their face they crucified him. The people who all they had to do was trust God and they could have possessed all the land without trouble. And yet, no matter how much people insist that God has done with them, He very plainly tells you that when they finally are ready to come back to Him, He still has a place for them. He still has mercy. He still has grace. He still has blessings beyond imagination. And when they do finally come back to Him, that's where they'll find ultimate peace. So if you want to know what that means for you personally other than just having a deeper understanding of what's going to happen do what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians learn from their example and realize you have a long suffering God that while your disobedience may cost you from some of the blessings while unbelief may make your life really hard while persecution may come while there may feel like there's times where he's done with you God is very long suffering and like the father of the prodigal son if we return to him dacă ne vom întoarce la El, He's more than willing to receive. El este mult mai voios de a ne primi. Now, like with Israel, you may do things that you can't undo. Ca și cum Israel, poate vei face lucruri care nu poți să le... But he is willing to receive. Uh, and that's where you will ultimately find peace. You want to see another message that comes out of that. For anyone who preaches to you that God permanently rejects someone. While there's still life in the body. You know, while there's still hope of turning? În timp ce este speranța te întoarcem? Well, no. Nu. What you see from this? Ce vezi în aceasta? Is that he'll let you go your way first. Dacă te va lăsa să mergi pe calea ta pe ceva timp. But when you're ready to come back. Dacă nu ești gata să te întorci. You know, when you're ready to finally hear the message he's been preaching. Când ești gata să împine să asculți mesajul care ți l-a predicat. He didn't reject you and say I'll never let you sit receive it. El nu te-a respins și a spus niciodată nu te voi lăsa să nu primești. He just says I turn you over to your wife. El a spus te voi întoarce 
te vom face în calea ta. But when you're ready to come, Dacă the ești gata uh, să vin apoi, and you'll see for the Jews that didn't come, Those, it's only a remnant that he says will believe. Well, they're grouped in with everybody else. Uh, and they will face his wrath. So there's some great lessons in this. We just have to read a little deeper than what's on the surface. And you can see how this applies to you. you know, how this applies to the lost. But like I said tonight, we can simply see a picture or a broad view of what's going to be going on with Israel building up to Christ's millennial kingdom. When he finally gives them back their land. 